Hi, this is Joseph Arthur. Thanks for checking out Come to Where I'm From. Please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash come to where I'm from. We are an independent podcast and any contributions you can make are greatly appreciated. We rolling? Yeah. Okay. We're here with Stephen McBean. That's me. Hello, sir. How's it going? I didn't mean to call you sir in a negative way. Sometimes when people call me sir, I'm like, don't call me sir. But it's usually like a young person at Starbucks. Yeah, I always get like sirs from like crusty punks on the street. It kind of sends me for a little bit of a spin. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh man. But when it's somebody like your same age range, it's not at all. There's no insult in it. Yeah. Like so, we're the we're pretty much the same. I'd imagine. We're surring around. It's cool. Yeah, we're we're a couple of sirs. So, um, and your band Black Mountain. Mm-hmm. It's pretty righteous rock and roll. I don't even know the. It's an interesting band to like figure out what kind of music it is because it doesn't sound like anybody else, but it sort of harkens to a bunch of other things that I that I certainly love and grew up with. Uh-huh. It was kind of a bit of a, I guess the chemistry in the beginning was a bit of a, there was a lot of happy accidents at play. Jeremy, who was just here, who's the, mm-hmm. the synth wizard with his, you know, his arsenal of uh, vintage stuff. He was... Yeah. Uh, he lived upstairs from um, our drummer at the time, and when we, when we made the first record, uh, we were like, I, I knew him a little bit. I had seen his band, Sonoya Caves, um, and there's this guy walking around, you know, Vancouver that looked a little bit like Nick Drake, very dapper mm-hmm. and stuff, and uh, we were like, do you want to, you know, do some some bleeps and bloops and oscillations on the record? And we figured, you know, we, we like... Uh, when we went to record his stuff, we figured he would just kind of, you know, space echo and some... And then he came, he had all these, like, really uh, brilliant orchestrated parts yeah. with his Mellotron and stuff that were like, we're like, damn, dude. And we're like, well, you got to join the band now. And he's like, hmm. He's like, well, I've never been on tour. He had played Vancouver, but he had never been on tour. He was a bit of a, you know... At home, alone with his synths and his mm. tea, but we took him on the road and he learned to love it. Now he's, you know, a big aspect of the sound, really. Yeah. So it's he, he's been collecting the, you know, he was into he was he was one of those guys. We were similar scenes, but slightly different. Whereas I came from the the punk scene, the hardcore scene. We kind of, we both meet, I would say that our, would be Pink Floyd animals. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's he's interesting where it's like, he doesn't, he's heard of things like Fugazi or Minor Threat or mm-hmm. Black Flag, but he, he doesn't, they're not, they're, they've never been on his radar. Even things like, he's a huge fan of like My Bloody Valentine. Me the, too. The shoegaze stuff, but. For some reason, he was never a fan of, say, Dinosaur Hus- Dinosaur Jr., Husker Du. Fugazi. Which, which were, like, big on my thing. So it's kind of interesting the way he came into it and his history of rock and roll versus mine. And, yeah, that was kind of the, a bit, a bit of the chemistry. Right. You know, it was, the, well, I mean, it was all the five people that were working together then, but. It's so funny because he just walked in the door. But did he walk in? Yeah, again? I shouldn't reveal the man behind the curtain, but yeah, he just did. He must have forgot something. But hey, we were just talking about you, Jeremy. Probably <laughs> forgot his ID. <laughs> we were saying glowing things about. I didn't know you used to look like Nick Drake. <laughs> he did. He did. Yeah, I used to get that quite a bit. Was That's cool. That's not bad. Yeah. Not Nick, Nick Drake's corpse, but... Oh, way, way far worse. Yeah, not Nick Drake's corpse, but no. he, yeah. When he was alive and well. Yeah. yeah. I like that Fugazi album, Repeater. Yeah, I mean... Uh, yeah. I saw them once at the, in Atlanta at the Majestic... Not the Majestic, that's the diner, but at... What's it called? Like, 
Masquerade, thanks, dude. Yeah, for five dollars. Yeah, they always played for five or six. Mm-hmm. I kind of have that thing where, perhaps it, you know, it. I still think of Fugazi as Ian McKay's uh, new band. Right. Guy from Minor Threats, new band. Yeah. But you know, still fighting for legitimacy, kind of thing. Yeah. The punk scene is like that. It's like, are you real? You know, they've they've definitely kept it real. They haven't officially broke up. Oh, really? They're still around. Apparently, they still jam too, just because they're all friends. Yeah. You know, with something like that, where you are living underneath Jeremy and it and becomes such an integral part of what you're doing now, do you like? think of things like fate and stuff or do you believe in that kind of thing like the universe aligning you or do you think it's just random coincidence i think there's some fate thing we were talking today about that the weird uh thing where you you think of someone Mm -hmm. and and then you see them in the next three days yeah it always seems to happen yeah the original internet is our subconscious yeah yeah, that's the more powerful internet. I, I actually, I was like, if somebody said this in an interview I was listening to, I can't remember what, but they were like talking about this was kind of anti-technology thing, and like they were like, imagine what we, how we would develop had we not had this. Like maybe we'd already psychically, like maybe we would be way more connected on a much more interesting psychic level like maybe we'd be evolving and developing psychic powers as as a species by now if more so if it wasn't for that i thought that was kind of interesting there's a thing though i was listening to uh alan watts the other day i love alan watts dude he's great and he was talking about going on some trip i don't know if the if he was uh, with students or comrades or whatever they were, but they, they, they were going to, let's say India. I think it was India. Mm-hmm. And all his friends and whatnot, they were, you know, bringing their, their uh, what do you call those things, cameras. Mm. And he, he decided not to bring a camera because he wanted to experience And everyone was taking photos. He's like, wait, you're not experiencing this. Mm. I, I, I think it's the... I mean, and that was probably in the 50s or the early 60s. And I think it's one of those things where, like, there's always been a history of some sort of technology, whether it's striking two pieces of wood and, like, don't, don't do that. You're going to, you know, burn the, you mm-hmm. know, the, the, the stones down or something. Right. Like if we never discovered that, maybe somehow we could produce fire from our eyes or something. Uh-huh, just uh-huh. like stare at something. Yeah. <laughs> just be like, Telepathy <laughs> for sure by now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that thing. We like were We were almost there with te- telepathy and then we lost it. I think Is so. Is that pyrokinesis? Something. When you <laughs> start fires with your mind. Yeah. Yeah, I like I love all that like uh, spiritual stuff, especially like um, you know sort of Hinduism stuff. But I I they lose me when they get into like um, developing powers like levitation and stuff. Mm-hmm. That's when I'm like, okay, are you really like we can levitate? It's like let's just see it, but <laughs> like let's just <laughs> uh-huh. you know let's just see it. It's irrefutable. Like if you could just, you know like. Why throw that into the mix? All this other stuff is already yeah. killer enough, dude. Yeah. You don't need to levitate. But I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Extra selling point. Yeah, I guess so. I guess some people need that, like the bells and whistles. Yeah. Like it's just happiness is not enough. I need happiness and levitation. Mm-hmm. Flying cars. I need to start fires from my eyes. Be cool. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, I would go for flying cars, though. That's not a bad idea. Well, that's coming. Yeah. I think that's already here. Those bird things, do they have them here? They're like in every other U.S. Oh, yeah. city, those little... No, I, I, they don't have them here. He's talking about scooters. Oh, yeah. No, like, uh, New York still hasn't passed. Uh, they're still good. outlawing. No it. weed and no scooters in New York. No weed still. No weed. Oh. Really? No weed. I it's, thought it was legal here. No, it's illegal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, out in L.A. working on my last record a lot, and I got into the habit of going to the weed store and getting, Mm -hmm. like, one of those fancy joints, and just, you could just do it, like, on, oh, I'm not going to go way into it, but let me just go buy one of these, like, Mac store package joints, and, you know, 
then I got back to New York and was into weed. I'm not I'm like now I'm off weed. I go in and out of that. Uh-huh. But um, then I like I phone ordered it and the guy came and he was like, I got Coke too. You want Coke? So suddenly <laughs> I'm like with some dude that's like got a shit ton of Coke too. Uh-huh. And I was like, I'm, I'm out. This is like, I'm used to it. Yeah, it's like funny that you could like in LA, it's like at a Mac store. It's all like respectable. And then in New York, it's back to the stone ages. Kind of keeps it real, keeps it edgy. Keeps it edgy, but that's too edgy for me. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to not <laughs> self destruct. Uh-huh. You, know? uh-huh. you mean buying coke from a miner is a little edgy? For you? Right. Yeah, it's a little too much. It's a it's a step too far. But so you don't uh, participate in the weed smoke too much? Not really. I've like gone through stages where you know, I'll 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 use it for. Uh, 10 minutes of like divine inspiration where it's yeah. like, Oh, I've just written the best song. And then the next day you wake up and you're like, Oh God, that's bullshit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're like, it's a terrible song. So yeah, it kind of messes me up. I got, you know, it kind of like throws me off my, I, I need to like have everything just right nowadays. I, find. Uh-huh. I think it's an age thing. There's certain strains, strands, whatever they call them nowadays, too, that it's like, they're like, they're like doing LSD. Like, you, you never know quite. You'd be like, be like, well, I'm having a great time. Or like, oh, I got to go hide under the covers for yeah. like 12 hours. Yeah. It's like, or like being on stage and you're so self-conscious, that type of thing. Yeah. I've had like a few shows where you have a little puff and oh, oh that's nice. And the other ones is, yeah, deers in the headlight. Mm-hmm too self-aware just like analyzing everything that's and then you break a string and then that's the end of the night yeah it's a meltdown (laughs) so you uh grew up in vancouver huh i was born there and then uh i lived one till ten in this tiny town in ontario called uh kleinberg which is uh at the time it was 500 people it's famous for it has the the McMichael Art Gallery, which houses a lot of the group of seven artists, which were this uh, collective of uh, Canadian artists that did a lot. Of, I think Emily Carr was loosely affiliated with them, but the kind of the Canadian landscape, like mm. like a like you know Gordon Lightfoot songs in a painting. Oh wow, um, that's a good description. Yeah, and. Uh, Pierre Burton, who was a pretty famous uh, Canadian author, lived there too. Is that where Neil Young grew up? He was. He is from Winnipeg. Oh, okay. Though he loves to sing about small yeah. towns in Ontario. And Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just recently heard that song. I never, <laughs> never have to hear it again. <laughs> yeah, you know what song by Neil? And obviously, all respect to Neil. Yeah, but I don't ever have to hear a man. I'm, <laughs> a man needs a maid. I, I could, I'm good. I'm <laughs> I knew you were going to say that song before you. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with you there too. But I mean, he's written. He's got you know. Didn't he have like oh a techno, man, he's the be- a one, one of the best ever. So trans, oh, yeah, but that's cool. Nope. Trans, trans, yeah. Okay. yeah, trans. Yeah. You you told me about that one. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't believe it until I saw it. Yeah, and then he had a rockabilly album too, mm-hmm. and um. Yeah, but that that kind of go- is a nice segue back to your thing too, because I feel like you have so many disparate influences. Is that how you say it? Disparate is that a word? I think so. Influences coming in to make this thing. It's really hard to peg down, <clears throat> and I think it's cool that you have uh, developed such a you know big fan base of people that have accepted you know or go in for what you're putting out because it is so on its own i mean there's no other i don't really hear any other oh this is part of a scene or something Uh it's kind of like your own scene i think well when we started like i was a lot you know when we started it was like i was into a lot of the german bands from the 70s and like the british prog and you know some san francisco psychedelia and velvet underground and all that and but when the first record came out, then we started touring, and then I became aware of a kind of a new psych scene around North America and Europe, and it, 
And you fit in with that. Yeah, we made a lot of friends, and it was also that time when when the the DJ culture was dying down, and the audiences were like ready for like drawn out rock and roll shows where the band stretch things out and it's loud and people take some time listening and you know that was like i guess 2005 the first record and so yeah we definitely hit a there was a bit of a what do they call those zeitgeists i don't know mm-hmm. but yeah a thing there was a happening there was bands like a uh, comets on fire from san francisco oneida from brooklyn but yeah, I wasn't really aware of anything outside of our own little world. And before that, you know, like when, so yeah, back to the, you know, the small town in Ontario mm-hmm. thing. Then, um, and then uh, through some, uh, actually the, the mother of the, the grandson who gave me this. Uh, Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, one of my cousins. Um, her and her brother were very uh, influential in the late seventies of playing me, you know, like Ziggy Stardust for the first time. Mm-hmm. Cheap Trick, The Cars. And How then, old were you? When the, I was when, about nine and ten. So I you, kinda, you were born in seventy or something, or sixty nine. Six, I'm seventy one. So it's, it's, it's as soon as as long as I can remember, like it. I was always obsessed with rock and roll, and it started with, I think it was Bay City Rollers first, mm-hmm. and then Kiss, and then there, I, I, I remember getting The Wall and stuff, and then when the, you know, the, the first, the new wave, the cars, I was big into the cars. Me too. They were like, I actually did a, a speech on the cars in grade five. That's crazy. But it's funny, I didn't know all the, I didn't know that Rick O'Kasich had produced Suicide or the Bad Brains or mm. that the drummer was from the Modern Lovers. I didn't, I was just like, my speech was basically, hey, hey, class, the cars are the new wave band from Boston. And that's all I knew. But then I kind of got into the, I guess the, the punk, so the Clash, the Ramones. Sex Pistols, and then started seeing things on bands like DOA and the Subhumans and the Teenage Head from Toronto. And then when we moved from uh, the small town in Ontario, Mm -hmm. (laughs) we moved to Vancouver Island, which is a big island, and we moved to the city of Victoria, which is a little, it's the capital of BC, and it's a little likes to think of itself as a you know a little little british town mm. but there were that was you know there i you know there was a scene happening there there was like a hardcore scene and so i played my first show there when i was 13 guitar guitar what'd yeah. you have i had a anjo les paul so it was like oh, okay a, les paul copy yeah and it was because of ace freely I loved Ace Freely. Yeah. I think I just, yeah, I always just wanted a Les Paul. That was the one you saw. Yeah. Um, Jimmy was, Page, too. Yeah, it was the coolest looking one. Yeah. Um, and then just that thing of, from, I guess, I guess, you know, the whole, you know, just being lucky that hardcore hit at that time. And I had a group of friends who were all in grade six and grade seven. And, this guy that had a fanzine and put on shows and the first show we played was actually with a scream from washington dc dave Grohl's band dave Grohl's. he wasn't in it then but he later joined and yeah it was that thing of just and it was also we lived on an island so there vancouver was on the mainland Mm -hmm. where like the bigger punk bands like you know pointed sticks and doa and stuff there were more punk rock bands but on the island there was all the bands were a little stranger there was a band called no means no mm. that kind of did a bit of i guess you could compare them to like gang of four right or maybe you know like even i'm sure they were probably into things like sparks and they were like i mean they were probably in their late 20s at the time but they looked like they were like 84 to me because i was mm. but yeah everything was a little bit more weird a little bit more out there and then yeah 
Yeah, you went in a better direction because I I was when I went from Kiss to Jazz Fusion. That was a fuck up. I don't know about that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you really. <laughs> no, but like, you know, I was a bass player because I was into Gene. Okay. Another fuck up. <laughs> Gene kidding. Simmons. Yeah, Gene Simmons. Yeah. It's all like that. I feel like. People our age, like our instruments, are determined by like which member of Kiss we like. <laughs> it does that seem to go sense. back to that. Yeah, uh-huh. a lot. Yeah. You know, and every <laughs> podcast it's either Eugene or Paul, and that <laughs> that sets your path. It was the blood and the fire that got me. It was like that was that was over the top. He had a good voice. Yeah, he no. sang the like real kind of. She walks by moonlight. Yeah. I mean, they're a great band. I mean, the riffs. Yeah, and I don't trust people when they. Tell me that they don't like Kiss. I'm, yeah. I'm just I'm skeptical of them. I'm just like really. I, re- I remember the first time somebody told me that they didn't like Led Zeppelin. That blew my <laughs> mind. They're probably just trying to be reactionary. <clears throat> well, it was a French a French gentleman. I don't know if I should name him because, <laughs> but he actually worked at Atlantic Records and helped put the whole box set together of okay. Zeppelin and wasn't was not a fan. Huh. And he 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 mentioned that oh yeah i'm not i'm not into it you know he was like took that sort of critical view that they've initially mm-hmm. received yeah and sort of never amended it he he went with that i guess both bands were like never loved by the critics they were fan right. bands yeah but i feel like zeppelin now is like acknowledged more so than kiss yeah I mean, I, critics even would have to say come on with zeppelin i mean even with kiss to me but yeah, it just blew my mind because that was kind of like my measuring of music was everything was measured against Led Zeppelin, basically. Yeah, I mean... So it blew off the whole, like, I didn't know where what was heads and tails anymore. I was like, where am I? I'm lost. Yeah, it's like those first four <laughs> records in, what, two years? Yeah. Probably touring constantly, and yeah. I think they were up to a little bit of partying at the time. Yeah. So you were 13 and playing punk rock shows. You might have been pretty good at that. Because, I mean, you don't have to be, like, maybe all that energy and youthful exuberance. Like, were you good at it right away? or We that... didn't really think about it. We we would do, like, things like Randy, the bass player and singer, he lived on a farm and they had a electrical fence. So we would jam in the barn and then between writing songs we would play with the electrical fence like Shut what up. just like take a piss we, on it and no, see what no, would you, you would <laughs> see who could touch it the longest <laughs> and then one person would touch it and you'd hold hands the, the the worst it ever got is is someone touched it we held them and then the other person held the you know the steel pipe that was uh, going, and so that was quite a shock Oh, really? Yeah. So that was it. And then we're like, oh. But, I mean, we never... But you weren't depressed anymore, which was good. Yeah, we were all good. It was like electric shock therapy. But it was that thing straight off. We were... (laughs) We never questioned... Like, immediately it was like, well, we, 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 we write our own songs. There was never, like, plain covers or anything. Looking back, like, I... Like, I never grew up playing guitar by, like learning song like i'm terrible at learning covers me and too stuff and i wrote songs because i would just start trying to learn them and then like it would just be easier to get creative after yeah. i learned the first two chords and then i would go off into my imagination yeah it just seemed the the thing to do and then we kind of i guess uh i guess the timing was right too for your for being a kid and you're you know we would basically we were playing as basically as fast as we could yeah we did like we had some weird tunings because because the bass we knew what we thought was supposed to be lower Mm -hmm. we would tune the bass tune the something like the third string third fret of the guitar would be no the the open e would be the third fret of the guitar so we could we were never playing on the right frets, but we just thought the bass is, it's just supposed to be lower. But that's actually a good idea. Yeah. That's like a drop D, like that's actually pretty inventive. Yeah. It's that's that not, thing. actually, that's pretty good thinking. There's like this, uh, <laughs> it's like, someone ended up like putting out a, a record years later of like our demos and stuff. And there's like a really early 
Well, people, we we put up an ad in the record store, like for our tape, and our tape didn't exist. It was like you would mail a, a cassette to us, and we would record a rehearsal for you on the Ghetto Blaster. And there was a nice, con- you know, it was the early '80s, so there were great Ghetto Blasters. With, mm-hmm. They would have compression on them or whatever. Yeah, you just sing straight into that, and I think only one person ordered that tape, but that one person still had it, and the one song that got put on this record it, like it's not to toot our own horn but it sounded like something that the boredoms or some yeah because it was so primal <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was like like we didn't yeah it was just it was technically garbage but in a way brilliant right <laughs> well I, i'm in a band with peter buck called arthur buck and we just uh made our, our second record and the Mixing engineer Jack Knife Lee, he put a bunch of stuff on cassette mm-hmm. anyway, mixed it to like to make it sound probably like oh, that. yeah, like they do that on purpose. Was Greg Foreman playing? Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm good friends with Greg. I love Greg, yeah. yeah, he went on the road with us, he's awesome. Shout out Greg Foreman, Greg Foreman, um, Mr. Pharmacist, yeah, Mr. Pharmacist 72, I think so, I think. Um, I wonder what year he was born. I think 72. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Delta 72. <laughs> what does he play in the band? Keys. Oh, keys. Yeah. Yeah, he's kind of an all-rounder, though. I think he can, mm-hmm. he can play guitar, too. Um, but so, wait, you guys, but you guys duplicated the cassette on the thing, or you actually recorded it? We just recorded the rehearsal. Each, so each, each one. Each tape would have been different if different more than one. one person had ordered That's it. That's so funny. Yeah. I heard that same thing from that Daniel Johnson did that. Okay, yeah. Like he didn't understand the concept that you would you would make duplicates. So uh-huh. every time he wanted to make a record for somebody, he would re-record the whole record. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it would be hard if you had to sell like a million copies. Yeah. Though. Dedication. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what happened after that? Then... Uh, I heard, uh, so I was into Black Flag, Circle Jerks, Crash. Keith Morris was on this Shout podcast. Out Keith oh, Morris. Yeah. Shout out Keith Three Morris. Three hour episode. Three hour episode. Love the Keith Morris. <laughs> Keith Morris. He's such an interesting cat. Yeah, his, uh, we have a jam spaces in the same building and I'll see him once in a while and his, his, uh, rock and roll history of shows is you're just like whoa dude (laughs) he's seen everything yeah um but yeah then so kind of went through that and then it was thrash metal crossover speed metal i guess i heard like metallica's kill them all and that was from playing really fast punk to learning how to palm mute you know a little bit more technical some widdly diddlies and some pitch harmonics that was like the being 16 by then was like the natural progression you started ripping leads so did some ripping leads mm-hmm. um did you ever get into mike varney's label did he put out like cacophony in that yeah like uh marty friedman to- uh yeah and tony mcalpine remember I'm to- a, remember tony I'm mcalpine a, <laughs> i am a huge supporter of edge of insanity by tony dude, mcalpine uh, edge of insanity is amazing dude i always like uh <laughs> if i'm in a store with someone because like someone because be that that was thing. my shit when i for a minute it was tony mcalpine edge of insanity yeah. it, it, i'll be like <laughs> if you have you heard that band the fucking champs no kind of instrumental instrumental metal but they're it's very it's got a bit of michael rother it's got a it's different elements they have a song called van jealous again which is a clever take on jealous again by you know black flag but i'll be like if you like this you will love this two dollar tony mcalpine record so just buy it right i'm also a huge uh the first uh, ingve malmstein actually mm-hmm. the, the strat that i have right now is the Ingstream. uh Ingve Malmsteen Strat. With the uh, concave fret thing? Though I took, I feel like a bit of a poser, but I took the scalloped neck off for you tour. Because I was bending them like It was fucking of, you up. You couldn't deal with it. I put the 10s on there and I was, I was like, like oh. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. 
That's cool. Yeah, so, yeah, McAlpine. <laughs> yeah, McAlpine. Who else was Jason Becker, Marty Jason. Friedman? Mm-hmm. And then who else did he have on that Mike Varney label? There was I just remember when I was that age, like 16, it was my dream to get into the mu- the three music mentions in the back of Guitar Player or whatever. If okay. You remember your demo was reviewed? Uh-huh. Oh, do you, yeah. Do you remember that section? I do now, yeah. Yeah. I ended up getting on it once as, really? a, as a bass player. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because I was into like slapping and popping uh-huh, and Jaco uh-huh. Pistorius. And, yeah. You know, ripping on bass the way, like, <laughs> yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. What was the band? My band? Oh, yeah. it was just me, my name. Okay. Yeah. I didn't have a band. I gotta check I just, some of that stuff. I just out. made my own demos. Uh huh. Yeah, but um. But when you played bass, you were in a band in. Uh, well, I did. I did play in a blues what were they band, called? Frankie Star and Chill Factor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Blue working blues band in Cleveland. Oh, nice. You know, played five nights a week. Played in Columbus uh, at Veterans Memorial, opening for Stevie Ray Vaughan. Oh, nice. Yeah. Did you ever stumble upon a? Is it Glenn Schwartz? Yeah. Yeah. That was, that's so crazy that you mentioned his name because not that many people know that name and how amazing he was. And he became, got into Jesus and yeah. started living in his car. But he was um, Frankie Starr's mentor. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So, so that was like a huge, he was like a huge figure for us. Yeah, we played. I can't believe you. Even ten know who years he is. ago at the, what's the ballroom again? Beachland. Beachland, and he played at five o'clock in the front bar, and we just stood there and we're like, "Wow!" Because it was like the Hendrix stuff through the the two. I think he had two uh, super reverbs, and then he would get up on the chair and just preach, Jesus. the fire and brimstone, and then play mm. like a beautiful country song like it, there was like yeah he was spitting and drooling it was it was mind-blowing and mm-hmm. I've, I've 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 tried to explain it to a few people but there's there's not that many clips on youtube where it, that i've found that really because it was like yeah like i say it was like the sound guy was like he's playing at five you and we're like whoa yeah but he was like the f- first guitar player for the james gang is that Mm -hmm. correct that is correct and i heard that Jimi hendrix once said he was one of his favorite guitar players yeah i heard that too so he he was your mentor well he was frankie's mentor okay yeah i you know i was a bass player so i kind of heard tell of him i didn't really ever encounter him okay but Uh he was just he loomed large because he was Frankie was a guitar prodigy, basically. He was yeah. like 18, but you know, you know, when we opened up for Stevie Ray Vaughan, Stevie Ray wrote Frankie a note saying, like, you inspired me. Like, he was that good. He was like outrageously good. Okay. And he got it, and apparently Glenn Schwartz was his teacher. Damn. Yeah. So. I guess he recently passed, like in the last couple of years. Is that right? Yeah. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. But you, you looked for him on YouTube, huh? Yeah, after that to find some, th- there's stuff on there, but I'm gonna look. Not that quite. Uh, doesn't capture it. He, he was in something. Something about the, the power, like after I guess after he left, went out to California, did a lot of acid, maybe became born again, and then he was briefly in a band, something about the electric company, something power. Mm-hmm yeah that's interesting it's weird like the youtube thing and how it's hard to capture live yeah. performances what do you what do you think about that like when you see people filming you live do you does it bum you out or you don't really care or? i just don't pay it any mind anymore yeah. it's yeah. like that thing where it's like you finish the show and the guy or the lady to like oh we want to get a photo of course and that's that thing where it's like you gotta have your flash on. you know and you're like but whatever right. i'll just like i know it's out there but you're like ah. yeah i know hey you want can i get a photo yeah okay you look really tired okay thank you <laughs> <laughs> like, you know uh-huh. like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah you're out in front of everybody when you're 
on the road in these like kind of extreme conditions to some degree. It's interesting. It's hard to keep your center. What do you do to keep your center out when you're on the road? I know early on when we started touring a lot, I, 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 I definitely developed a, what would you call it? A drug habit? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> like a, just a extroverted, like, you know, when you go to the club and you got to meet the people and, you know, right. just, you have to kind of you, put it I'm on. usually like, I like to be by myself a lot of the time. And mm -hmm. when I, was, I didn't even really talk much when I was a teenager, like so when, you know, when me and Patrick over there hang out, you know, Shout out Pat. Shout out Pat. Pat Higgins. Pat Higgins. You know, he gets in 10,000 words for every of my 50. Right. But, you know, it's cool. He's got That's good stories. Entertaining. But, yeah, I don't know. You just develop different personalities to navigate the weird life of being in clubs and being in vans and being in gas stations and, yeah, just all the... I mean, I love it, but it's 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 bizarre. Mm. You know, you, a lot of times the road's weird too because it's like the home life. You know, where it's like I think the saddest thing was when you first start touring a lot. Like your friends are like, "Oh, you're going on tour," and they're all really excited for you, and mm -hmm. you come home and they're like, "Oh, how was it?" and stuff. And then it's like, then it, there comes the Point where it's like no one calls you anymore even when you're home because they right. assume, they're used assume to you. you're on the road you're yeah like, they're ah. used to you gone i remember that like when i would first tour and it's like you'd have to kind of reacclimate yourself into uh -huh. into the scene or whatever yeah it's interesting it's an interesting way to make a living especially yeah. now i think always i i almost said especially nowadays but i don't know that it's ever been like I think there's yeah there's there's definitely I mean I, I mean when I was like in the yeah like the first punk band that I was in it was like the goal was just to play a show right and then it was to put out a tape or a 7 inch mm -hmm. and the, I mean in the 80s the touring thing was we couldn't even fathom how it was done or how you would get anywhere or how you would set up a show i remember seeing like maybe in 86 i saw like suicidal tendencies and it was like mm -hmm. a punk show where it was like there was like like a lot of people at right and i remember me and my friend we were like watching and we were like it was the first time it ever dawned on us we're like like how much do you think they're getting paid to do this like there's right. a lot there's a lot of fucking people here right but you know a lot and then it was just like then one you know record and then tour and it wasn't until i guess i started touring in other than seattle and vancouver victoria and stuff first u.s tour would have been in 1992 and what uh, band that was a band called gus gus and it was you singing and playing guitar? I or? sang and played guitar. It was like a, a little bit of amphetamine reptiles, maybe a bit of butthole surfers, mm -hmm. bit of hardcore, kind of a lot of angular stuff, a lot of touch and go records kind of stuff like Big Black and I was big into Steve Albini then. Um was that you or me? That was me. Oh, that was, that was cool. <laughs> that, was, that was an That's involuntary crazy. noise that just came out of me. That it picked it up. Can we edit it out? Anyway. <laughs> no, yeah, I like Steve Albini too. I mean, his recording philosophy and character. Yeah. You know? and his, his, I always liked his lyrical subject matter. Oh, that was interesting. and But, yeah. How long was that tour, though, the 92? That one? was like 10 weeks. And, but it was probably like it would be like maybe two shows, three days off, another show, four days off, then maybe three shows in a row, and then you'd maybe be making your way to Austin, Texas, where you had a show at Emos or in a van. Yeah, and uh, so, you know that's when we discovered the America and it's the beauty of the rest stops. Mm -hmm. So we would just sleep at those, and 
I guess it was Maximum Rock and Roll put out the the book your own fucking life zine that had like the contacts for all the you know punk basements or clubs or whatever. So we played like Gilman in Berkeley and played ABC No Rio in New York. Um, God, when you think about it, it's like that whole punk aesthetic or philosophy and everything about that is such a great thing for a young kid to be like immersed in because it teaches you self-reliance. It teaches you, it's just, it's actually, you know, if you don't take the destructive elements of it on board. Mm -hmm. It's very creative. Yeah, it's very creative, very, you can do it, you can do it yourself. You know, it's just, it's basically like Ralph Waldo Emerson with some, you know, at one something BPM. I don't know how many BPM, you know. Yeah, I put out like a fanzine when I was, I guess, 13 and 14. I remember one day, like, you know, I I, I, inter- I did a, a male interview with this band, Tervit Cadet, from Finland. Mm-hmm. And I, they sent me back the answers written on paper in a live cassette. And my mom was like, she's, it was, she was, all, it was like she, she was mad for some reason. Or like a mom, or more, maybe being protective. She's like, well, why that? How the hell are you getting? Why are you getting mail from Finland? And I was like, mm-hmm. Cause I'm fucking hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, you know, and then like, I was getting Flipside, all these different Flipside magazines. They would, you know, send to my house and the, getting these record. I only put out like a few issues, but people would send their records for review, and it was just that, you know, I would put it together. I got all the letter set, typed it all out. You know, my paper route paid for the, the photocopying and used to soap the stamps back then so you could, you know, reuse them sometimes. See, that's a good example of like when you don't have, like what happens when you don't have the devices to constantly occupy yourself. You you know, the human, mm-hmm. the human mind needs to formulate all these activities to entertain itself. Yeah. You know? It's a, bit like, it's a bit like sexual transmutation. I know that's a weird off thing to say, but it, it is like if you, because if you like don't have sex, you know, all that sexual energy. And if you retain your seed or whatever, that energy doesn't just disappear. It, you, ha- it, it, it uh-huh. goes into like, like that's what like, uh, what Napoleon Hill it looks for an outlet. Napoleon Hill, like Think and Grow Rich, has a whole chapter on sexual transmutation and stuff uh-huh. like that. And so I think that's pretty cool. Like, um, teenage yeah. angst transmutation. I don't, yeah, it's just like, it's just like giving yourself limitations and just like, uh-huh. I don't know, you know what I mean? And, and funneling your energy into different areas that it wouldn't normally go. And if you can be somewhat disciplined it's like uh, it's like when george costanza started stopped masturbating became very intelligent had a memory I again is that, that i i never got into that but that's <laughs> funny i'm on that i'm on that no fap journey right now i don't do that i had like a actually I, 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 was, yeah. <laughs> I was on tour with a, a different band of mine <laughs> and the drummer was like he's like i'm just horny all the time like i can't stop masturbating i was like i was like you know if you just stop like it'll it's like what you're saying that will go away it will go away and you will yeah you'll start reading a book or right you know but you have to have some discipline like you have to not watch porn for one Uh you you have uh to stop following like booty models on instagram you can't do that (laughs) you know you know like you got to can't you leave got, the house. Well, no, yeah, yeah, that's true too. In New York City, it's kind of crazy, but uh, yeah, you can leave the house, but just pick your moments. No, at oh. night, just leave at night. I don't know. Yeah, there's so, lots of different ways of. Did Did he take that advice? He did, did he, and then he, he figured it out. Then he was like, "Huh, you're right." Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I don't think he stuck to it, but whatever. Right. Well, it's know. hard to stick to. I know. You know, it's one of those things. It's it's enjoyable like, too. So yeah. So then, so you guys like, uh, so you had that first tour and then, and then what happened? That's the second time I asked, and then what happened? We did more (laughs) tours. We did, I think that band did like. What was that band called? That was Gus. Gus, right. And we did like, I don't know, we did like four or five 
long tours of of the U.S. and Canada. Yeah. Where we made some friends, and I mean, a lot of the. It's weird how a lot of the. Now the alternative network that all these bands navigate across North America and and Europe and stuff. A lot of it was sprouted out of the original punk scene and like these bands That's that would I mean too. It's like, play the small towns as opposed to you know new york san francisco or whatever it was like and and doa from vancouver was definitely i think with black flag one of the bands that would play all the small towns mm-hmm. it's like black flag came to victoria like three or four times like on the last time, and they would always bring the SST bands with them, and it was like the last time they had their own PA and like everything. Like it was just a traveling machine mm-hmm. that was probably all booked on like, I think they used to always have like these like military 1-800 calling cards that they'd, everyone, people would pass the number around so you could go to pay phone and call long distance, you know, for free. and For what? What are you just calling? To, just Call could call the kid promoters in every city that wanted oh. wanted to do the shows. Oh, I see. So there was like a network that you kind of could yeah. tap into. Yeah, because there was. I mean, there was no. There was like like I like I was talking about before. There was no. There wasn't even like a dangling carrot or golden carrot or whatever you call it of like oh, headlining Coachella. Like there, right. there 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 was no, like you're just doing this. It, and it's like war and it's and, beautiful right and, and it's like there's no that was the destination yeah to do that like i just actually watched this video on meditation mm-hmm. and they're like oh so many people are meditating because they're trying to get something that's i mean that's the hard thing about meditation but, is you're not trying to get anywhere right <laughs> but meditation is the destination that's like, weird yeah, I don't know, but it reminds me of that. But so did you ever go to like college or anything or did you just go like I'm a lifer in this? I got uh well, I I my 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 parents have I think well, let's put it that me and my parents had had enough of each other by the time I was I uh, was 15, so I briefly lived in a foster home. From that, I ran away from the foster home to Vancouver. Wow did that wait so hold on are you are you do you have contact with your family of origin now? oh yeah we're 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 super close now that's amazing very loving very loving parents very smart my dad's so, a scientist a professor you mm-hmm. know uh climate change scientist do you believe in climate change i do i like well i mean i mean climate is obviously changing but do you believe humans cause climate change I mean, there's a lot of factors. I'd I'd say that, you know, certain industrialization things have definitely had an effect. Right. But do you think it's over? I mean, I don't want to get you into like trouble. Like, no, I, no, I get no. it. Like, I don't want to, like, <laughs> <laughs> we can veer off of this because this is controversial, but, you Next know. Next question, please. Do you, do you think that it's as dire as maybe some of the um, people? say think it is or the 12 years left type of thing or do you think that's i'm not sure i don't know there's like it's it's funny talking to my dad because he like when i was born he was he was still in university and then uh he got a a government job working for environment canada so Mm -hmm. he would you know go around taking water samples and stuff like that and then when i guess he was when he more entered the field, the, the, the big thing in the early 80s was Acid Rain, mm. which is a pretty cool and, name. And, yeah, <laughs> and nuclear bombs. Uh-huh. But the Acid Rain, actually, uh, the earth healed itself from yeah. it to some degree. Yeah. Um, he's not a doomsday type, but he's definitely like, we have to do things. But it's, I mean, it's one of those things where, I don't know... Sometimes those conversations they just get so depressing. Yeah. And I've been recently I've been trying to find well right now I'm reading uh it's a book by Wayne Gretzky, the <laughs> the hockey player and it's ninety nine, his number, uh 
tales of they're like short stories so it's 99 tales of hockey they're about either a different player and all these different things that's cool he and, wrote a book on 99 tales of hockey yeah and it's they're they're things where i'm well this can you know this could be taken back to marty friedman and all those guys where mm-hmm. I, the, I find it very fascinating human evolution where you know eddie van halen can do like the taps for the first time and it's mind-blowing and you're like whoa how mm-hmm. do you do that? and now it's like you could walk in the guitar center and there could be like 10 10 year olds that are mimicking it but it takes right. it takes a certain creative mind to come up with that for the first time right but in the, the goreski books it's it's interesting because he's talking about they're like players are so much faster now than you know in 19 19- 43 mm-hmm. and, and then he's then he brings up the argument you realize in 1943 people were skating around with 25 pounds of right. skate you know and like their stick weighed 180 pounds and, <laughs> so, and it was made out of hay so if you could, yeah if you could put that <laughs> you know it's kind of i guess in a, in a way it's it's, it's I was, we were talking about this the other day the whole thing of the genius versus the 10,000 hours, hours of practice argument and just well the genius needs 10,000 hours I know maybe but you know certain people put into certain like the fact that yeah like I I moved to like I had like pretty much a, a perfect 1980s teenage years like they were perfect like I you know from punk to speed metal to the cure or whatever it might have been yeah. it was just like the movies we were talking about uh yeah uh, yeah we got lucky i know in hindsight and retrospect we really did like you know, that was like rocky like seeing that in the movie theaters mm-hmm. and shit like you know what I mean? yeah. it's like, you know, getting the girl's number fast time Richmond's high yeah waiting for that you know i remember the excitement of like waiting for the girl to call you're sitting by this phone mm-hmm. you know or all those things. And then I, I remember like th- that same kind of excitement, except for I was older, but then it was like that thing where like dial up network had entered. So you'd mm-hmm. pick it up and there'd be that horrendous sound. So you <laughs> quickly unplug the cable to disconnect the modem. And mm-hmm. but, yeah. But so why, what happened um, when you ran away? Why'd you run away? I, I don't know. There was there. I went. You were to, a punk. I was a punk, world, so and there, there I went to Vancouver, and there was this scene there that I was like, "Wow, this is everything I want yeah. <laughs> for music and lifestyle and friends." And and it was yeah, it was really wild. Yeah, I mean, I mirror that to a degree because like I started in that professional band when I was like sixteen. So mm-hmm. a similar thing. I was pretty much gone at that point. Yeah. So. I didn't run away, but I mean, I didn't get home till three in the morning and then I would go to school for a half day. It was like I was living an adult life. Yeah. And then when I, so I I left school at grade 10, I briefly moved back in with my parents under the condition that I would go back to school. I went back to the school. They wouldn't let me back in because I was apparently too bad a influence on other kids. That's incredible. <laughs> well, I also convinced my best friend to run away from his home, too. So, <laughs> in Breakfast Club, you would be Judd Nelson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I'd be Anthony Michael Hall, unfortunately. He's... <laughs> <laughs> Who would you be, Ehud? Ali Sheedy? Uh, Emilio Estevez. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> he was the jock, right? Yeah, he was <laughs> no, the that's jock. That's not me, no. Yeah. Was I was probably Judd Nelson. I hate to say it too. I think I'm Judd Nelson was like, too. I cut class. I, I think everybody wants to be school. Judd Nelson. Terrible. But you know what book I'm reading right now is called Born to Run, and it's about those guys in Mexico that were like barefoot runners that would have like you know tires on their feet and they okay. like beat everybody. That's why I'm wearing these kind of oh. shoes. <laughs> Are you a runner? Yeah. Right on. Yeah. I, I do all kinds of stuff, man. Like uh-huh. run. I go I, I, today. I went to yoga and Pilates. 
Oh damn! Tomorrow I'm boxing. Actually, okay. like a uh, um, Alan Vega's widows who got me into boxing. Really? She's my good friend. Yeah, Liz. Cool. Shout out Liz. Nice. Yeah, and uh, um, that stuff I need. Mm -hmm. uh, like I think I would have self destructed. Yeah. Without that stuff, like um, I was kind of getting to that a little bit too. Like, do you have any rituals that keep? Because I just know the creative life is mm -hmm. not for uh, the faint at heart. And um, so you must have some things that keep you I, yeah. your head together. I started doing the the Bikram two I years love, ago. I love Bikram, dude. And like I try, I miss it on the road. It's hard to find, but I, yeah. usually at home I go every day. Yeah. I do do some running, but I go watch the knee. But I did once I... Maybe like run barefoot. Last. Your knee will be your knee will heal. Really? Yeah. Huh. Because be, the reason it's counterintuitive. You think that's why I'm experimenting with this because, uh, and I'm late to this. This was like a thing like six years ago. Everybody was on okay. this. I literally just got into it like last week. <laughs> but like the idea is your feet are already perfectly designed mm -hmm. and the heel, when they get the big padded heel that yeah. everybody thinks protects it, it actually has the opposite effect because you, you heel strike hard and you're not like really sensitive to what's actually happening. So you're sending shock waves up into your knees uh -huh. and you're jacking your limbs up. But if you run barefoot, you, you have to run more gazelle like, and you have to be lighter on your feet and you're more sensitive to the whole thing. You're more intuitive to the whole thing and the feet actually absorb uh -huh. a lot of the shock that way and so people with like bad knees can suddenly like heal their knees and run this is kind of some of what i've been reading which makes sense and i've only just ex yeah. started so i don't i can't verify it i mean people really didn't you know a lot of years of running before nike came along really right you know and they and they and then they like put all these things like you need these you need this but the, this uh vibram thing is like their phrase is you are the technology <laughs> i love that. <laughs> that that's a pretty good tagline it is i want to write a song you uh, are the technology <laughs> don't steal that from me man no, i try not to <laughs> of course i'm stealing it from vibram so you can steal it <laughs> but um so that's cool so when when did you so you didn't go to college no you, you, you kept, i did get my ged and i went to college for one semester one of the, ugh, there you go for the grade semester. 10 one semester yeah. and it reminded me of everything i like hated about high school right but i did the one semester i did like all 101 whatever political science science <laughs> political science silence uh, all that <laughs> shit That'd be a good subject to learn political silence <laughs> yeah more people should learn that subject <laughs> political <Yeah>. silence <laughs> like, were you still playing in bands when you did that semester mm -hmm. so you didn't yeah. quit no. Nah, he ain't quitting, no. man. That was like I, I could have told you that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was the condition for your parents or something to come back or quit this devil's Just all, music. There's always been some band. So did you get like odd jobs or like when did when mm -hmm. did when did uh music take over and what were some of the odd jobs you had along the way? There was a lot of dishwashing. Then mm -hmm. from dishwashing I was a backline cook. I did that and uh -huh. that. Yeah, and then uh, <laughs> a fair cooking, bit of warehouse. Cooking <laughs> Wait, cooking what? Uh, breakfast. And what did you cook? I actually cooked at a semi gourmet restaurant called. Really? Yeah, like because my because I was I got into AA quite young. Oops, I shouldn't say that. That's Whatever, okay. you're not allowed to say that. But like at 20, I was already in AA. <laughs> like, and a lot of people in like a lot of good chefs are there so my good friend was a chef and he brought me in as a cook oh, wow. so i like started cooking polenta and like sauteing mushrooms and doing nice. all kinds of fancy shit wow. so it's pretty cool it's yeah. a good gig i ended up yeah i ended up working the door of that place though being a bouncer and collecting money and stuff i could crack uh, two eggs in each hand four at a time oh, that was... you can i could i did yeah <laughs> i don't know about now that's pretty wild it's all right but yeah, did you ever drink raw eggs? I did, especially during my uh, rocky phase. Yeah, did you get into boxing? <laughs> Just in the, I remember uh, I set up like a garbage bag full of like sleeping bags and was mm -hmm. training, you know, in, in the garage and stuff. And I, this is still when I was in the small town in Ontario, mm -hmm. and uh, I 
think I saw the, the local Tufts were walking. I, was, I don't remember what they said or something, but I ran up to them and I, they immediately got me in a headlock and beat me up. Uh, they used like, some jujitsu <laughs> on you. I was like, I'm not going to be a boxer. So. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when did when did you get like a record deal or something that like financially made you be be able to float yourself with? Bob? Not till like. I mean, like, 30, I guess when I was 34, 35 was wow. when, when Black Mountain started and my other band, Pink Mountain Tops. And we just started touring. I was then working for this this place in, in Vancouver called the Portland Hotel Society. And then, uh, luckily enough, they would give us tons of time off to go tour and Wait, where were you working? It's a place called the Portland Hotel Society. And this was like more of a long-term job? I, I worked there you. for like 10 years. Okay. And what did that do? What did you do that? You were... Well, their whole... They worked in harm harm reduction. With uh, So downtown east side of, of, of Vancouver, there was like a... Big drug scene. Drug scene, homelessness, alcoholism, yeah. all these... You know, and it got pushed to this... Because all the heroin comes One in. neighborhood. Yeah. And, and they were... Uh, you know, they kind of started out with, with one hotel and needle exchange kind of thing, and it grew to, they kind of took over the SORs. You know, it was kind of that thing where you, homeless for the people, you know, you can't be evicted, and, you know, like, you know, mm. there was methadone doctors there and all that kind of stuff. You, you know, it was, it was, the different buildings were different degrees of, there was more, the one that I worked at was the Washington Hotel. Was my, you know, there'd be like kind of either old jailer guys or. And what would you do? I would, you know, administer meds. I would, you know, uh, snake the unsnakeable toilet full of everything. Wildness. T-shirts and rigs and. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then I just hang out with people, you know. Was, know. was that gratifying work? Not the snaking so much, but like just helping people and and being in that scene or was it depressing? it was like i guess it was like my um, the, the the job interview was basically like you know can you take this and it was, and they're like just don't let the building burn down and i mean it was it was it was interesting because a lot of the people that lived in these buildings i had seen for years on the streets and all of a sudden you know i became friends with them to some degree and mm -hmm. learned their their stories right and there was, you know, there was, there was definitely a few like first wave punk rockers that, you know, were living there. And there was a lot of old punkers that worked there as well. Then there was, you know, this, I guess in Vancouver, there was a big thing when Expo 86 happened, the, you know, the mental hospital closed down. A lot of people were put onto the street. Mm crack cocaine hit so there the whole thing was schizophrenia and crack and then mm. the heroin and but they 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 did they, they, they did a lot with bringing like the hiv infection rates down you know in that in that area they actually started the first uh safe injection site where you could go and shoot up and there'd be nurses there and there'd be all the needles and it, it had a unwritten like a bubble as far as the police couldn't it, fuck with you and it yeah it, it it did a lot of a lot of good down there vancouver is weird because it's it's one of the few places that i've seen where gentrification coexists with extreme poverty yeah it's an interesting place like that too because also you can be in the middle of a like kick-ass city and then see a beautiful mountain and a body of water yeah, you know, it's not that many places like that. Yeah, it's 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 a yeah, it's a weird place. People, it's, it is very weird. A lot of people from all over the In world a good way, come Vancouver, there. Vancouver, calm like, down. <laughs> yeah, down to the east side's kind of like yeah. nothing else. So you weren't flipping it. Were you flipping out, like going like, oh no, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna do this my whole life, or were you? Because I, I just, I know I got my first record deal when I was twenty five, mm -hmm. thankfully, and I, and I think thankfully, I'm yeah, thankfully. And then, uh, but I remember because I was working at a guitar shop at that point, mm -hmm. and minimum wage, and I was just going like, man, it, like because I didn't go to college either, so I yeah. was like thinking like, fuck, like, 
how am I going to make it? Like, am I going to have to work minimum wage my whole life? Did you have any of the, these kind of things? Or were you sort of gratified in the work you were doing so you weren't freaking out like that or what? I kind of just still had that thing where it's like, you know, I'd never toured Europe or there was these things. And I just wanted to experience, you know, I don't know what it was. It, it was wasn't really a monetary thing, but a, a bit of like, I didn't even think it, you know, it was going to happen. So I didn't even really think about it. But I remember I made the Pink Mountain Tops record and it was. Then we made the Black Mountain record. It was that thing where, like, I just felt like I think we have something. Something's happening. Mm -hmm. And I had done a, I had a band previous to that called Jerk with a Bomb. That was, that was my stage of really getting into songwriting and songwriters and being obsessed with, you know, more folky stuff. Or? Yeah, it's it started off as a two piece, you know, where it was just. There was a little bit of country, some folk, you know. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the name. I know. It was, I think it. I think the name. That's like your self saboteur coming in and uh, naming uh -huh. the band <laughs> like jerk with a bomb. It's like. <laughs> well, it, I, I guess it first came out where it was like I I got a four track, so yeah. I decided to make a tape that was like not punk. Right. So there's a bit of Billy Bragg in there, then some yeah. a bit of noise, kind of different things, but I think probably the. I think the jerk with the bomb thing was this thing of probably hanging on to the punk, being like, "Oh, don't worry, I'm 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 still I'm punk. still punk." <laughs> I get it, um, I get it, because that same thing happened to me in in my way because I was doing like loud, sort of fast, mm -hmm. heavy bass rock and roll stuff that was trying to get people in the mosh pit to go nuts, and then yeah. I like dropped all that. And got an acoustic guitar. Yeah. And uh, but that is what got me my deal. And I just made I, I called it Joseph Arthur Music. So it, uh -huh. still had my, it wasn't Jerk with the Bomb, but it was like I understand that 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 mix. Like and so then when you came back to the Pink Mountain Tops, and, yeah. And it was kind of like the culmination of what you had learned with Jerk with the Bomb. Yeah. Like and the hardcore and the rock and roll stuff. Yeah. It seemed like both of those were. Uh years of navigating through influences and phases and things and but yeah there was a, i just felt like i was like we've, you know we've got something here this is this is good and then we got and what know, what was that like what was why why did you think that i don't know i think it was just the thing where sometimes it's just that thing where you could just tell it just there was a magic it just made me super happy and it didn't seem like it was like we had tried too hard it was very natural and right. it, was, it seemed fresh to my ears i don't know friends liked it you know i don't know yeah um i think the the band before like jerk with a bomb because mm -hmm. <laughs> we put out three records and they we kind of morphed into like with each record had an added member uh -huh. um and near the the last record, it was like I had that craving to hit on the big muff again and yeah. write a riff and yeah. you know that do a little solo, a little widdly d. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it was starting to, you know, so that so the 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 folk elements of Black Mountain and Pink Mountain Tops that kind of rooted in that phase of like you know being obsessed with 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 Dylan or mm -hmm. Towns Van Zant or Nico or whoever and then also like yeah like with the with the kraut rock and like the you know mm. kind of rediscovering like even though i'd always been like a, a pink floyd fan since day one like kind of re-embracing it and like it was also at the same time that all the that zeppelin stuff like the box sets the the live dvds came out so uh, the guy who didn't like them put them together yeah and it was also the i guess it was, was the how beginning. the west was one right i don't even i don't know the name of it it's got like a pyramid or something yeah, on the so cover the west was one yeah okay it was eve beauvais shout out eve beauvais <laughs> <laughs> anyway but yeah then uh so pink mountain tops that got that got some sort of label attention for you or what we both both the bands got signed to jag jaguar from bloomington 
So let me get this straight. So Pink Mountain Tops and Black Mountain were going simultaneously. Okay, and they still are going simultaneously. They, they still are. Oh, okay. They're okay. they're a bit more intertwined at the beginning. Oh, so you were kind of like, is that the connection with both of them having mountain in the name? Or I think so. Is that on purpose? Yeah. Inter- uh, I don't know why, but pink mountain tops maybe. And a color, pink and black. Mountain. And yeah, just a little. I remember you just added tops on pink. It could be yeah, black mountain and pink mountain. I think there were, there was definitely a time where. Me and Josh, who was the other member in Jerk with a Bomb, or <laughs> we're like this, we're just well, also, also too, like this, you know, that band it was before 9 11, too. So then it was just <laughs> sorry, <laughs> so things, things were definitely, especially being from Canada at the time, uh, yeah. Things became they're a little more. I'm not sensitive. laughing at 9/11. No, okay, just to get it straight, it was just the timing. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's a first. You're the first person that made me do a spit take, dude. <laughs> Honestly, that's funny as hell, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, <laughs> it's like all right. Oh, but the, oh, yeah, the, the, yeah. There was a <laughs> back to jerk with a bomb <laughs> pre nine eleven. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, we just uh, we decided things oh, would be man. better off with a, you know. And I think I remember coming up with the name Pink Mountain Tops. I was like, that's a really good rock and roll band name. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Black Mountain around the same time and. We signed to when when I think at Jag Jaguar, Jag Jaguar at the time, Chris Swanson really liked Pink Mountain Tops. Was his first one was more of a sex oriented record, I guess. And uh, Pink Mountain Tops was yeah a sex oriented kind of in a fun way, so, you know. A little, a little, like how so? Just a subject matter or vibe? Both, you know, bongos and Randy, Randy, uh, subject matter. Oh, that's cool. Um, and then Darius like black mountain a lot and uh they didn't want to sign two bands that they didn't we hadn't personally met at the time and then i I said i didn't want to make it one and then they thought about it for a week and uh then they said okay we'll put both out and they came out six months apart that's amazing and if you take the two records and put them together it makes one photograph that was darius's uh cool scheme that's cool Oh wait! Oh really? Mm-hmm. Oh. Ah. Yeah. Is it really just one band though? Well, it was the same people at the time, but it, it morphed. In, I, guess, I guess Pink Mountain Tops would be officially just me, mm-hmm. whereas whereas Black Mountain's more of a a real band. A band. Kind of. Yeah, that's cool. And then things just started. How'd you get connected with Jag Jaguar? Did you send them something, or were you a fan of what they do, or did they? I liked what they did because they had Jag Jaguar. They had Circuitly Canadian, so they they had Anthony and the Johnsons. They had Songs Ohio. They had a bunch of other stuff that I liked. And they were. I remember we sent like a bunch of labels tapes, and they were the one one of the ones that wrote back. That's cool. And they kind of they actually we kind of kind of grew together as a label and as a band so they've become pretty successful with well they have bon bon Iver, bon Iver. angel olsen sharon van etten uh, yeah they're a very big label yeah i would say is that and a good label because you mentioned bon Iver, mm-hmm. as our mutual friend joe burns was telling me yesterday when shout he out said joe burns we were coming to interview you that he saw you at Johnny Brenda's and Bon Iver opened up for you guys. We, we took Bon Iver <coughs> on, his, on his first his first tour. But really? It was, it was about three weeks East Coast. So I guess it would have been 2009? He said eight, eight or nine, yeah. Yeah, it was like when first record came out. and was That's because you were label mates? That was the yeah, only- and we had the same booking agent and he sent us they sent a, a bunch of different bands like who was a booking agent uh, Adam Voith at the time for oh, okay. Billions and they were like 
you want to take some of these bands on and the I guess we thought the Bon Iver was the coolest. Was it the Forever Emma or mm-hmm. what? I forget the, for, the name of that, but that's a great yeah. album. That's a really good album. I mean, it's beautiful. And it it, it was interesting because it <clears throat> it we saw within like like it was like a lot of people were showing up to see him. Like it was really quick, and it was cool. He his guitar player Mikey was his guitar student who had never been in a band before, never mm-hmm. played a show, and had that thing where I think generally what normal people think when you you join a band, you just join a band and you get huge. Yeah. <laughs> so, you get yeah. huge, huge, yeah. Yeah. huge. So, and it happened for him. Yeah, that. And and he, <laughs> I think Mikey still plays for him. Yeah, that's great. And he was like, I think he was... N- I think he was just turned 19 because when we went to, when we played in Toronto, he was able to drink at the bar. And I remember him being like, hey, Steve, I'm going to go, I'm going to go play the show now. Will you hold my beer? And I was like, one, I'm not fucking holding your beer. <laughs> well, you, two, you're like, take your beer on stage. Like, yeah. You know, I don't know. But he's a sweetheart. That's funny. Still friends? I haven't seen them in a long time, but. Did you have any any uh, feelings, any kind of feel, any kind of certain way when they got like so successful and it was like, hey, they were opening up for me and like that. We've had a long history of band, like the uh, the uh, War on Drugs opened up for us I, I, at I, massive at the yeah, massive now, yeah, wherever we played in. I've had this Brooklyn. happen to me too, dude. Yeah, a lot like, of those bands. Like, you know, like where I'm like, hey, wait a minute. They, <laughs> like, they also like, ascended. And I'm not gonna quickly. lie, I felt a yeah. certain kind of way sometimes. So, yeah. I, mean, I let it go, but so you know what opened, I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, they hey, opened what's wrong? for you guys before they were. Big? Yeah, like about nine years ago. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, does that evoke any, or evoke no. any kind of. No. Because we'll probably. Not like, anything against them, more just uh, the way that manifests in me is more just like it, if it, it can help the 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 devil on my shoulder that says you're not that like you know like it uh-huh. can it can give that guy a little bit more ammo yeah i don't know no i mean we've we've had i mean the fact that i find it sometimes i think we're still like a new band yeah i feel that way now i i feel absolutely like i'm brand new even though yeah. i'm you know the people still that anyone comes out you know you go to belgium and like yeah like oh cool there's 500 people here oh yeah no so, i've i've yeah i got an attitude of gratitude about the whole thing at this point yeah and i think maybe like yeah like when we when we hooked up with jag jaguar it was like things went they went like you know pretty quick you yeah. know yeah and that's not to say that you guys aren't really very successful cuz you are I mean, you like, just went but, to see them last night. Yeah, yeah, a couple nights ago at the Bowery Ballroom. The Bowery. Watch the KXP show today. I feel like I'm a new fan. Right on. Yeah. Right on. So, do you want to pick one of these cards? A fan of mine gave these okay. to me and said, "Use them on your podcast." Andrew from Chicago. What does yours say? I haven't read any of these, so I don't know. I don't even know what they are. Can you take them out of the plastic? (laughs) Yeah, you can. I think you can. I don't know if you need to. Here's yours. (laughs) No, you got to pick yours. (laughs) Just having trouble reading mine without my glasses. Mine says, happiness adds and multiplies as we divide it with others. A. Nielsen. These are all happiness. happiness Mine has adds happiness on it too. And multiplies as we divide it with others. Hmm, I like that. That's pretty cool. That is cool. Can you read this one? Because I can't <laughs> yeah. quite read it without my glasses. Happy. Yeah, I guess that's it's a, a lot of happiness. <laughs> happiness does not come from doing easy work, but from the afterglow of satisfaction that comes after the achievement of a difficult task that demanded our best. Theodore Rubin. He lost me halfway through. Uh, yeah, like I, my, um, what do you call it, ADD or whatever, yeah. yeah. I didn't really, yeah, that was pretty good though. I caught it, go ahead. Uh, happiness is neither virtue nor pleasure, nor this thing 
nor that, but simply growth. We are happy when we are growing. William I, Butler Yeats. I totally agree with all that stuff. I, I find like my happiness elevates in direct proportion to how many like things I do in a day that initially might like suck. Like mm -hmm. going to yoga, like, or going on a run or like that kind of stuff or cleaning up or like, you know, I can really get myself into a really good state if I get like that disciplined vibe going. Yeah, some of the stuff I miss on tour is like really mundane things like washing dishes, mm -hmm. cleaning up, maybe sweeping a floor. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of times where I've realized over the years that things that I've dreamt about that I've wanted that would bring me supreme happiness actually don't <clears throat> do that unless you're there already. Yeah. Um but yeah, I like the yoga, but then I also got into the, been on a couple uh backpacking trips. So you go like a week into the bush, you know, up in Kings Canyon, California. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, oh yeah, I'm really happy right now. Mm. And all I'm doing is just walking for hours and hours with 45 pounds on my back. Yeah. And it. Yeah, it's it's interesting what alone? So, uh, I went with uh my lady Brooke and her dad. He was the, kind of the one that saved us cuz he's been doing it since he's 20. So he was you know, I would have never known that you need a bear canister for your food and all these different, you know, you got to have the water pump so you can get the you know, purify the water out of the lake and stuff. Mm. So is that a new thing, the camping thing or hiking? Well, Last two years, lots of hiking before, but an actual, I've done camping forever, but it's always, what do they call it? Glamping where there's, mm. glamping, yeah, at yeah. least there's a car by or something, but this yeah. was, these last two times is the first time where actually, I guess it was five nights, six days. We did like, I think the last one we did 52 miles in the six days. So you, you hike like. About five to eight hours during the day. And then pitch the tent. Pitch the tent, you know, eat your food, go to that bed. That sounds fun. You know? I want to do shit like that. It's cool. I've never done that. It's really nice. Kings Canyon in California is beautiful for that. Part of the John Muir Trail goes through there. So there's different, you know, you can go for two days, you can go for go for months if you wanted to i'd be afraid i'd be one of those people that would get lost out there and be like oh he came back six months later <laughs> and like i lived on red ants you know that type of thing. you see people <laughs> <You'd be dead. laughs> come on dude i would survive uh, nature is harsh <laughs> the, the the trails are pretty pretty uh, they ain't, they pretty no late <laughs> I you, want and to me, you, and me, you and me can go up to Bear Mountain and hike for an hour, dude. Happiness is a byproduct of an effort to make someone else happy. I don't know about that one. I don't either. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. So I feel sure. like you can only be happy towards someone else if you're happy yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like self empathy before. And you happy can is have a weird for, word. In an, what in is happy? Anyways? I don't know. You know, I don't, it's, it's kind of like that thing where like sometimes people will be, wow, isn't playing music fun? And I'll be like, what is, I don't know, well, what does fun exactly mean? Cause I don't, I don't, there's part of me that, you know, it plays music for so many different reasons. Yeah. The struggles and the necessity, the, but I don't know fun sometimes it's fun yeah but it's it can be euphoric it can be ultimately depressing yeah fun and happy they just don't encapsulate the full range of yeah. emotions of what the thing is yeah you know they don't, they're like little reflections of a of a sliver of it yeah yeah it's fun but it's also a lot of other things. It's also yeah. not fun. Yeah. And it's also <laughs> like you know, like it's it's everything. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's, that's probably why I love it or continue to do it cuz I have to. Yeah, you you have to. Of course, yeah. I know that. Herman Hess says the best things are born out of necessity. Yeah. 
I'll take his advice on that. Yeah, so do you listen to like uh, a lot of philosophers like Alan Watts and stuff like that? Or Yeah, I went through a big stage of him. Recently I got into the the another thing I was the nonviolent communication. Who's that? That's uh what is his name? Don't look non nonviolent communication. Can you look that up on your phone quick? Patty. Thanks, Pat. Tour manager over there. Come on, tour manager, Pat. His name is. Uh, I feel terrible not remembering. That's all right. It's 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 it's. it's we can edit. He that wrote part. the he wrote the book in the sixties. He'll uh, edit it anyway. You know. Oh. You guys listen to podcasts on the road, you and Pat. We listen to some. They listened to this one once, at least some of it. Yeah, listen to the Vernon Reed one. Yeah, that was cool. Marshall Rosenberg. Yeah, Marshall Rosenberg. Huh. I've never heard of him. It's really good. It was like a, a way of, you know, like there's what people's needs are and your needs being met, other people's being, you know, and anger and like, you know, it's like you're not necessarily angry at me. Your just needs aren't being met, you know, like, I don't know. It's interesting. He, he did a lot of like, I guess later on in his life, he did a lot of peacekeeping stuff. But he was heavily involved in the civil rights movement with like negotiating or not go, but being a mediator between like perhaps students and campuses or police and activists. And it's taking full responsibility for the spectrum of your own emotions. Yeah. And just like, you know, like, why am I angry right now? Like, why am I angry at, you know. At Pat, for instance. You know, why am I mad at Jeremy for stomping around in here? It's like, well, Damn. he's making this noise, but his needs aren't being met because he's like, well, I, I got to get to the kitchen and, you know, boil an egg. And but wait, if you're mad at him for stomping around, that means the need you're getting isn't being met. The yeah. need for silence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he loves when I talk about this shit. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, McBean, I wish you would just start stop drinking again. Start drinking again. You quit? Unofficially. Yeah, I, I, yeah I'm not drinking either. I actually, I quite enjoy the not drinking on tour. Yeah, the clarity of it is, is nice. I got really good at being in the back of a van, vomiting for five hours straight into a Starbucks cup. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. I feel good just as... I, I could always put myself together by the time you got the sound check, mm -hmm. whatever. But that's, I mean, that's also like the difficult thing. I don't know if it's difficult, but the thing about the reality of the road, it's like sometimes like, you know, you're like, you fall into these, you know, it's like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm going to, you know, keep it mellow tonight but then friends show up and then the club right. gives you this thing they call a rider yeah so you're like i'm gonna you know i'm gonna ride on that and <laughs> next thing you know yeah but i feel i don't know i i felt it, at first i was a little i found it hard getting my uh swagger shoes on without her because a, a little couple, bit of couple whis drinks. whiskey or whatever would get you know feeling loose and stuff I was like how do you do this but then it was then I kind of felt that I was playing better most of the time and enjoy it. Yeah. Thing is too is when you're when you're playing live, you can you can consume so much alcohol because of the adrenaline or whatever it is in that sixty to ninety minutes, but then you're off the stage and you're you're just a pile. <laughs> yeah, and it's really difficult to not reach for those things everything is momentum based mm -hmm. you know so if you have the habit of like oh i'm drinking here and there it's like the momentum of that just like takes you down a certain way like i could definitely sit here with you right now and drink a couple glasses of wine and be fine and mm -hmm. not it wouldn't it wouldn't turn into anything weird or anything but like if i allow that as an option then yeah. eventually and and the eventually means like three days from now Mm -hmm. you know i'm gonna drink way too much and you know because you can't control it. i i mean 
personally, I can't control it. Not all the time. I could control it sometimes, but mm-hmm. not all the time. And only being able to control it sometimes ain't good enough, unfortunately. Yeah. Or or whatever. But I'm I'm with you on that. We've been doing a band planking, which is pretty fun. I'm into planking. Planking's pretty cool. Yeah. How much your longest plank? Uh, me and Adam will sometimes do three minutes. Wow. Um, I think Jeremy is. That's got, a round in boxing. We, he's gotten we do up that. to two. I can do three minutes. Uh, sometimes I'll do like a maybe like four two minute planks a day. That's great. So, I feel like we should plank. What plank? <laughs> <laughs> so how long have we been going? Ninety minutes. Oh, that's we good. We can wrap it up. That's a solid episode. Just, uh. just so people know, it is midnight. We started yeah. a little late today. Uh. Yeah. What else? Anything else? No. Tony McAlpine covered well, that. We've covered a lot. We've covered more than I thought we would. It was fascinating. <clears throat> I love your voice, just yeah. as a general. Yeah, you're fun I, to I talk know, to, yeah. Dude. But like, I get sucked into like. You should do like you could do books on tape or something <laughs> or a podcast. Or a podcast. I got I got some bad uh, pronunciation skills. <laughs> you're all right. I didn't notice anything. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You know? Well, I don't know. What do you think? Come on, Pat. What's the final question? Jeremy, you there's got to be something we've been talking about, well, what, Patty, that I we had, haven't touched oh, I on. I had a, a question that's just curious. Did uh, Matt, Pink Mountain Tops and uh, Black Mountains ever co had like play on the same bill with one? Oh, open that's a for good question. Other? We did one uh, tour of Europe because our bass player at the time had a, a band called Blood Meridian, and all three bands played. The same bill. We kind of ref- it was kind of the the Black Mountain Army tour. Mm. It was fun. It was fun. Oh, I wanted to ask you, why'd you name the album Destroyer? <laughs> well, me and Jeremy, when we were working on this record, we because that's a Kiss album, right? I mean, it is. You know. <laughs> I'm actually. It's. <laughs> I'm gonna call my next album Hotter Than Hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were we, we we knew what we wanted, but it Joseph was funny. Joseph Arthur alive. <laughs> yeah, wait, wait. What did you say? Well, we had an idea of what we wanted. It was like we were, we wanted like an accelerator, eliminator. We wanted this thing. We had then we were on all the you know, mutilator, mutator. Why? And it's just something that fit with the music. We just that was the vibe, like and, something aggressive and destructive. Yeah, just something like an action name, you know. We just and then uh, we came up that came up, and that was seemed so ridiculous. But the I guess the not to let too many cats out of a bag, but Destroyer is also a band from Vancouver. That's Damn. Very close down Behar. Yeah, yeah, from New Pornographers. Oh, uh-huh. right. uh, okay. Yeah. So there was that. I mean, if if it had just been the Kiss record, it, it would have been like we can't go there. But the the fact that it no, was I tied totally in can. with with Destroyer from Vancouver too made it this tongue in cheek joke. There were some other things in there too that were just Canadian humor in there. Yeah. But then I've actually been surprised, like how few people even bring it up even bring up like you know there's maybe been like a couple really you know pissed off german rock journalists oh really like oh i don't know how 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 could you possibly you know name your 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 album after the most famous kiss record (laughs) it's not the most famous kiss record is it isn't it? It's well, well, it's their break breakthrough. Was it their breakthrough? I don't yeah. know. It had Beth on it. Well, oh, it did. Yeah. Oh, okay. Detroit well, Rock City. Well, I I know Beth from like one of the live ones, Kiss Alive too. I think. Yeah. But so, um, but like Wilco called one of their albums Star Wars. So if they can do that, you can do. Oh yeah. It. Yeah, I think it's cool. I don't think it, I wasn't giving you a hard time no, for no. it. I think it's fucking rad. But that's funny that a German journalist gave you a hard time for it. <laughs> I think it was a German jerk. He, uh, you know, Austrian probably. Funny, the first time I heard it, I thought of the car. You what? Uh, oh, I thought of the car. What? What car? Is there a car called? Oh, the Destroyer? Dodge Destroyer. Yeah. Is uh. there one? 
I don't know. That I would be so. a weird car name because it's like, come on, like <laughs> you can't call a car destroyer. Look that up. Yeah. No, you can't. Because it the, sounds like it. Maybe the font. I don't know. Yeah. Have you ever uh, heard of Ho'oponopono? I think you should enlighten me. It's a Hawaiian mantra. Okay. That's like goes like, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. Uh huh. And it's, um, what it's, is it? Oh, it? It's called Ho'oponopono. Okay. There's a book that Joe Vitale wrote called No Limits. And it's about this guy, Dr. Hugh Lin, who um, cured this hospital for the mentally insane by like just reading the files of the patients and repeating this mantra taking if he if he read the file and, and he would take on board whatever disturbance they had yeah once it entered his field of consciousness to him it became his issue ah. and so he would pray you use this prayer to clear it and so you can kind of clear out like things that are disturbing you or something like this. I mean, he healed a whole mental institution, but just on a personal level, you can use it as a great mantra to clear out negativity. And so you're opening up the pathways to be able to live out of inspiration rather than from memory and just keep repeating the same patterns over and over again. But it's uh, it reminded me of that one book you were talking about, about... Um, the nonviolent communication. Mm -hmm. it, okay. It reminded me of that because it's a similar thing in terms of just like taking full responsibility for everything in your field of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So you, you get a, do away with the sort of victim mentality. Yeah. It's really powerful. You should look I'm into gonna, it. I'm going to write that down. It's, it's a really good one. There's lots, like I could, sometimes there's like eight hour ones on YouTube mm -hmm. that you can sleep to and you can, uh, there's like hour ones. Sometimes I run to it and it's, it's a really, it's a really cool Really, uh, really the, oddly powerful, like because it's I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. You know, and it's I was gonna play a little bit of one, but you can you can look it up, I, or I could send it to you. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. I yeah. actually went to Hawaii for the first time for my fiftieth uh, birthday. Oh, congratulations! With my parents and my girlfriend. Wow, oh, that's beautiful. That was cool. Went to Kauai, the nature island. That's great. I can feel that that kind of rings a bell from perhaps yeah. something. So you've probably encountered it before. Yeah. On this do, you, podcast. do you have any? Do you have any kids? No kids. Any interest in that? I just hang around with Pat. Right. That's what I was doing for a while. Ever since he like, ever since he quit my band to join your band, I'm like, I'm like kid crazy now. I need a kid. <laughs> Yeah, that's like that's what it is. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Oh, destroyer battleship. Yeah, like destroyer gray, the color of the dodge. Huh. For challenger. Oh, uh, for the challenger. Yeah. What's the longest yeah uh, you've ever run? Uh, thirteen miles. Okay. Not not. I I want to I want to <coughs> I want to amp that up in the next in the coming year. I'm hoping this when I develop these ankle. And, muscles and stuff for this barefoot running i, I feel like i'm going to try to do a marathon this year i kind of want to do a marathon i did like 10 miles once just to see if i could do it and it destroyed me but actually uh, one of the label guys was was at the show in uh brooklyn and he actually was on letterman for he holds the world world's record for most elastic bands <laughs> over one's head in like a minute he put like i don't know like I don't know, like 530 elastic bands over his head in a minute, but he does the marathons. And I was like, that's something I'm, uh, I think I'm interested in things that I was never interested in doing before. And those are the things that, yeah, that's you know. the benefit of getting to this sort of midpoint in life. It's yeah. like you, you, if, if you keep your spirit alive and you know, you sort of maintain yourself against the barrage of nonsense you, you your life just keeps unfolding in interesting ways yeah you know it's true i love it dude thank you so much for doing it thanks for having me really appreciate it this it's was a good really time. really fun talking to you right on all right my brother wooba daba wooba baba <laughs> gooba gaba tony mcalpine forever motherfuckers <laughs> we're out thanks thank you <laughs> Thanks, Pat.
<laughs> I can't believe we. <laughs> Hi, this is Joseph Arthur. Thanks for checking out Come to Where I'm From. Please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash come to where I'm from. We are an independent podcast and any contributions you can make are greatly appreciated.